Hi, and welcome to part two of this Send Success Deaf Awareness training. In this part, we'll be looking at the types of listening devices and the importance of using them. When looking at listening devices, there are many types of listening devices available to assist with hearing impairment. These can range from simple generic amplification devices right through to more complex cochlear implants. This training will look at the three main devices that you are likely to find in your mainstream classroom. These include a behind the ear digital hearing aid, a bone conduction aid and a cochlear implant. I'll also give um, some brief introductions to the radio aid and there will be another webinar available in more detail. We'll start with a digital hearing aid. This is the most common type of hearing aid that is prescribed by audiologists and you are likely to come across these if you have any hearing impaired students in your classroom. These are called the behind the ear type hearing aids because they sit behind your ear with the mould part going into your ear. If we look at the top here, you'll see that there are two little microphones. So these need to sort of be positioned just at the top part of your ear so that they're sitting in the best place to pick up any sound. We also have this plastic part here, which is called the hook, which helps to anchor it to your ear. We then have some tubing that comes down into your mould. Now the mould, you would have to have an impression taken for your mould. They are set to fit your ear only and they need to be a really good fit Otherwise, you'll hear lots of whistling. So when children start to grow and their ears get larger and you're hearing a constant whistling, that means that they require new moulds. They can split um, quite easily. And again, you would hear a whistling. If you hear a sort of intermittent whistling, then that may mean that the mould is not pushed in properly. And that's the first thing to do is to have a look and make sure that that mould is sitting flush within the ear. Um, on some of the hearing aids we have programs, most of those now will change to different environments automatically so you don't have to worry too much about that button. And down here we have the battery compartment. Um, this is generally the on off switch as well so you can see this little part here, you can just hook that open, that will reveal the battery um, and also it's the on off switch. It's just really important to remember at this point that whichever device um, your student is wearing, they will never restore normal hearing and it is just to allow them access the speech. Obviously there are lots of limitations of hearing aids. Hearing aids do not restore normal hearing. The sound can be very distorted and sometimes incomplete. Um, if we're thinking about distance, as you can see the microphones are very small so it's really important that you are standing uh, near to your hearing impaired student. Any more than two metres away, they're going to pick up whichever sounds are nearer to them. And if that's not your voice, then they won't be able to hear instructions or any discussions that are taking place. So it's really important that they're near the front and that you position yourself so that you're within one to two metres. Uh, this is also good for sort of lip pattern as well. It's very easy for pupils to mishear or misunderstand what is being said. Um, although the device is giving them good access to your voice, it will also amplify other sounds around them. As I said, you know, if you've got someone who's a bit of a chatterbox sat next to them, then that's the, that's what their hearing aid is going to pick up. If they're sat near to a noisy piece of equipment, say an old computer that's whirring, or if it's the summer and you've got a fan on, that hearing aid will pick up all of that noise. So it's really easy for them to mishear or misunderstand what is being said. They cannot always um, select the most relevant sound that they need to be listening to. So it's really important that if you address the class that you stop and that you make sure that you've got their attention. If you start talking, you know, the class start to hear your voice and they'll give you their attention. For a hearing aid user, that's very difficult. So you would need to maybe call their name or tap them on the shoulder or just let them know that you're waiting to speak to them and make sure that you've got their attention. The distance, as I said, is an issue. So ideally, you need them to be sort of sat near to the front, um, maybe not directly in front of you if you're moving around. 
they need to be able to see the board so often it's quite good to have them just sat to the side but always be thinking of that one to two meters um, again just thinking about assemblies where they're positioned assembly if they're not a radio aid user and we'll talk about radio aids a bit further on um, but again it might be that they need to sit nearer to the front for assemblies uh, the quality of sound is always going to be an issue as i said although all of these listening devices give them a much better opportunity to be able to pick up speech um, they are hearing through a digital device and they're listening through a damaged auditory system so that quality of sound is never going to replicate um, good hearing and although technology is advancing all the time um, they're still going to be disadvantaged Maintenance is really important um, that they look after their hearing aids. Um, molds can become filled with wax if they've got particularly waxy ears. Molds can split. The tubing can become hard, which distorts the sound. Um, if they get wet, if they're stuck in their pockets all the time and they get full of pocket fluff, it is really important that they look after their hearing aids and they will have been given um, some maintenance advice and tips um, at the audiology clinic when the hearing aids were prescribed um, so just to make sure that they're keeping them nice and clean and the most important thing is that they should be wearing them every day um, it is suggested that they should be worn all waking hours obviously you're not able to control that but we would expect that they are wearing them for school every day um, if they're not i will be phoning home and finding out why if you remember in part one, if we looked at that audiogram and the difference between what they can hear with their hearing aids on and without, if they're coming in regularly without them, they will be missing a significant amount of your lessons and every day that will put them at a further disadvantage. Uh, for some of our students, behind the ear type hearing aids um, are not suitable. The reasons may include uh, microtia, which is a malformation of the, uh, the pinna, which means that they are unable to use a behind the ear type hearing aid, or they might not be powerful enough. Um, in these situations, an audiologist would make the decision to fit a different type of um, device, one that's more appropriate for their hearing loss. So the next device I'd like to introduce you to is a bone conduction aid or a BC aid. So um, a bone conduction aid is often used for students that have got uh, microtia, so a malformation of the, of the pinna. Um, so how a BC aid works is it, if it's um, a temporary one, they, it will sit on a headband, like a large thick piece of elastic, as you can see in the picture here so this is just a large sort of piece of elastic this little box here is positioned just behind your ear on your mastoid bone and just the other side of that bone is where your uh, cochlea sits so the the bc aid will pick up sound in a similar way to the other types of hearing aids and it will cause this little box here to vibrate so that vibration will go along your mastoid bone that will then in turn stimulate your cochlea so move your cochlea which will help to send a signal up to your brain that's a very um, brief way of putting it so it helps students that maybe have got a conductive loss so maybe they've got glue ear so any sound that might be passing through their ear will be lost so what the bca does the bone conduction aid is it sort of bypasses sound having to go through your eardrum and it just sends that signal directly to your bone, which, as I said, can then send that signal to your cochlea and up to your brain. Many of the students that we've got that use bone conduction aids do have glue ear, so it's just a temporary measure. Um, for those students that may have, as I said, malformation of the ear, and so it's a more permanent loss, they can opt for surgery, so a more permanent um, device that would require surgery you would have a small titanium peg which is screwed into the bone behind the ear and that box would then go directly onto that peg um, there are other options now so 
you may look it, if you were to speak with your audiologist the parents would speak with the audiologist there are other types of devices that they might find are more appropriate Um, although many children do have success with a bone conduction aid, as with any hearing aid, there are limitations. It works best with close contact. So if you have got the bone conduction aid sitting on top of a lot of hair, that's going to impact on the um, on how well the signals pass through your bone. If it's again the distance, if you're trying to pick up your voice from a longer distance. Um, it means that it won't vibrate the box as much as if you were up close. If it stops working, the clinic would have to send them back to the manufacturers and often those manufacturers are overseas. Um, so you might be without your bone conduction aid for a longer amount of time. Um, so where possible, uh, keep uh, students may have a spare one. So now we move on to cochlear implants. Uh, these are probably the most complex of all of the listening devices that you will see in school. Um, it's important to know that it's not a bionic ear. There's lots of um, lovely films on Facebook and things like that on social media that show um, children or babies being sort of switched on and it's all everyone smiling and it's all happy and there's a lot more to it than that. But um, you know, they are generally only offered to those people that have got a profound hearing loss or a severe to profound hearing loss um, at the moment. And those whose cochlea um, are healthy enough to be able to host that implant successfully. Um, the decision to fit a cochlear implant is not an easy one. Um, it, there's a lot of assessment involved. Um, it can be a very emotional uh, decision for parents to make. Um, and it's definitely not an easy fix. Um, if you were to go ahead with it, if a student were to go ahead with a cochlear implant um, and everything was successful, then they do have every opportunity to develop age appropriate language. And with any of our devices, the earlier that that hearing loss is diagnosed and the, the quicker the implant can be um, fitted, the better chance they have of being age appropriate with their language. So um, a cochlear implant will present an, an electronic version of sound, unlike a behind the ear type hearing aid, which will present a digital type of sound. Um, but this electronic sound, the, the brain has to learn to interpret that. So um, it's not a case of just switching it on and you being able to hear someone say hello. All your brain will hear at that point may be clicks or beeps or it might just be a sensation that you get and your brain has to over time has to learn to interpret what those sounds are or what those signals are and this can take a long time this can you know but again it, it really is dependent on each person their history if they've had hearing before then that might be something that happens much quicker if their brain has already heard sound and has a memory for sound if you're looking at someone who's been profoundly deaf from birth, <clears throat> excuse me, then it might be that that takes their brain a lot longer to be able to interpret those sounds. Now we're looking at potentially a few months before they would recognise their own name. If you were thinking about someone who'd been profoundly deaf from birth, um, so we are, you know, we're looking at a long rehabilitation. It is definitely not an easy fix and it requires you know a lot of assessment um, and you know family not just parents the, the wider family really need to sort of be on board um, so the, the implant itself comes as two parts so you've got the external part so um, the part that you can see on the outside so you've got the speech processor which sits behind the ear um, which will then send information that it gathers up through the, um, the transmitter and the coil, um, which sits on the head that's held on by a magnet. You've then got your internal part, which includes the electrodes that will directly stimulate the auditory nerve. So when the decision has been made to go ahead with a cochlear implant, 
um, that student would have to undergo um, an operation. Uh, it's quite a long operation if they're having bilateral implants, so on both sides that can take up to sort of five hours. So it is a um, quite an emotional time and, and as I said it, it is a decision that's not been taken lightly by parents. Um, so for the operation what they need to do in order to be able to um, put in the implant they'd have to sort of make a space available within the skull for the internal magnet antenna and receiver pack to sit. So that pack is roughly the length of your thumb the first part of your thumb so from your nail to your your knuckle um, and it's nice and flat um, so they would sort of um, clear a space within the skull for that pack to sit as flush as possible um, and then you can see this sort of grey probe that goes through the middle ear and then coils into your your cochlea so they would have to position that um, and again which is why we have to ensure that you've got a nice healthy cochlea so there needs to be a nice clear space in in order to be able to sort of push that probe into the cochlea um, as far as we can. So once all of that has been um, implanted, that that person will be left for about four weeks for it all to heal. Like with any operation, you must ensure that it there's no infection and it's kept clean. Um, during that time, um, if this were a student that did have some access to sound, even if it was you know sort of loud environmental sounds. Um, when they're pushing this probe into your cochlea, if there if there did happen to be any hair cells in there that were working, um, there is the chance that they can be damaged. They do try their hardest to preserve them, but there's no guarantee. Um, so the outcome of that may be that that person then has no access to sound um, at all. So even if it was just loud sounds that they were able to hear, there is still some comfort in that. So to, to be without that can be quite distressing um, and there can be lots of different sort of reactions to that. So that's something that parents sort of have to be aware of. So once that four weeks of, of sort of settling down it is up, um, they will return to the hospital for activation or switch on. And this is when the outside um, transmitter is first connected to the internal receiver. Um, so the, the sound processor sits behind the ear, there's a microphone on there. Um, once, as soon as that's attached and everything's switched on, that's the first time that any sort of sound will be passing through from the transmitter to the receiver. Um, so this might be the first time that there's been any sort of sort of stimulation. So what will happen is that the sound, the microphone will pick up the sound, that sound is passed along the, um, the coil up to the, the transmitter through the external transmitter. It's passed through to the internal receiver. And then um, an electronic signal is sent down this probe. And the part where you can sort of see that it curls into your cochlea, there are 22 tiny electrodes that sit and they're spaced out um, along that sort of curve, so the inside part of your cochlea. So when the outside, from when the external transmitter is connected, it will send a signal to the internal receiver. That will send a signal down the probe. That probe will activate the electrodes. Those electrodes will then stimulate your cochlea in a as close a way to your hair cells um, would and that would then send um, a signal up your auditory nerve to your brain and then it's up to your brain to sort of interpret those sounds. Um, obviously you know if this is the first time that that auditory nerve has been stimulated um, can be extremely frightening um, for the person and there's lots of different reactions that will happen for for most uh, people having a cochlear implant, the first thing that they'll experience is a sensation uh, rather than a sound. Um, if you're thinking about a brain that's never heard sound before, um, certainly not speech, um, it won't understand what it's hearing. And there's a real sort of uh, rehabilitation process that happens after you've um, been fitted with a cochlear implant. Um, and a lot of that is 
sort of helping your brain to interpret what it's hearing. So to begin with, it's been described as clicks and beats, sensations. Um, and really, that's what your your sort of brain, the information your brain is getting first. So when you see these lovely sort of um, social media videos of babies being switched on and they're smiling and, you know, and you would assume that they can hear mummy's voice and actually that's not what they're hearing at all. And for some, as I said, for some people, it can be quite frightening. Um, as I said, it can just be a sensation that they're getting from that nerve. So the consultants and the people that are working within that department um, we would keep a very close eye on on how things are, are going. Obviously, they don't want it to be a frightening experience. So, it, it you know, it can be a very slow and lengthy um, experience. Again, it really is dependent on each person. They'll have a different experience. They'll take to it differently. Um, so no two are, are going to be the same. Um, if you do happen to have a student that's within your classroom um, who has got a cochlear implant. Um, apologies for the end of that last slide. I thought I'd move my slides on, but it hadn't gone. Um, there are a few things if you do have a, a cochlear implant user um, within your class, there are a few things that um, you do need to be aware of. And I think probably uh, the most important thing is that Although they have really, really good access to speech um, when they're wearing their implants, when they're not using those implants or if they were to take those implants off, they are profoundly deaf. Um, and it's very easy to sort of forget that because they, when using their implants, they can be um, really good listeners. So it's always important that you bear in mind <clears throat> that they are profoundly deaf. Um, and obviously, if there were to be any issues with their implant, um, hopefully if they've got bilateral implants, then they would still be able to use the other one. But if there were to be any reason why they were broken, um, and it would hopefully only be for a short amount of time, it's about making adjustments within the classroom. Um, and maybe you might have to have um, a care plan in place for if that were to happen. And also, if you're going to have a care plan, it's to think about when you're on trips, particularly overnight trips and things like that. But obviously, at those sorts of times, you, um, you would take advice from your teacher, the deaf and parents. But it's just something to sort of be aware of. Um, so without their implants, they would have no access to any sort of sound. Um, the other really important thing is that if they were to receive um, a knock to the head, particularly in the area where the implant is, that it's vital that you make contact with parents and that they make a decision as to whether to phone the consultant so they can have a direct phone number for the hospital. Um, what we don't want is if there were to be um, a knock to the head and that implant were to be moved, that can allow for infection, which can be extremely serious, as can any sort of ear infection. So again, just to sort of be mindful of that. Um, if you are doing science experiments, um, just again, be mindful of any strong magnets. Um, don't allow the children to do any party tricks where they're putting magnets close to their implant site. Again, we don't want to cause any sort of movement to that, to that implant and allow infection <clears throat> to set in. Um, and just sort of generally to sort of be mindful um, some of our teachers do familiarise themselves with the implant site. Um, so you sort of, you know, it's quite useful to know what that feels like in case that child were to come up and say that, you know, they've they've bumped their head or that something doesn't feel right, that you can sort of have, have a look and, and make sure. And I think um, really, if you've got any concerns, just, just call the parents um, and let them make the decision from there. So just to uh, briefly introduce you to uh, Radio Aids, I will be doing a separate webinar that will go into Radio Aids in more detail. Um, a Radio Aid is a type of audiological equipment which can help students that use behind the ear type hearing aids or cochlear implants. Um, and it's basically made up of two parts. There's 
um, the transmitter which a teacher wears around their neck, which has a microphone on it, and the pupils will wear receivers either that are attached to the bottom of their digital hearing aids or onto their sound processor on their cochlear implant. And basically what the radio aid does is it allows a direct link from the teacher to the child. So anything that's going in through that microphone will go directly to the receivers on their hearing aids. Um, and it's as if that person is standing roughly a metre away. Obviously, radio aids are fantastic if you're in a noisy classroom because it gives a, a sort of direct input into your hearing aid. So it cuts out a lot of that background noise. It can be used during assemblies where the distance um, may be greater than two metres. So their hearing aids would struggle to pick up the teacher's voice who's delivering the assembly. It will give them a direct input. Um, outside PE, you know, all of our equipment now is wireless. so their receivers won't get in the way so they can use it maybe outside where there's environmental sounds or just in the hall where the acoustics aren't always great and that will help to for them to follow during PE. Um, so generally it just sort of helps to keep background noise to a minimum. It can be used for group settings so even if you're sat right next to that student I would still advise using the radio aid as it will still give that sort of direct input. You can also encourage the other students to use the equipment, obviously making sure that you've looked at how to do that appropriately um, so it doesn't get doesn't get broken. As I said, we will be delivering a webinar that will go into this in much more detail and there are lots of sort of um, radio aid simulations available online if you wanted to have a look. So. Um, there are a set of quality standards for the use of radio aid. I'm not sort of going to read through all of those, but it's just to sort of draw your attention that there is um, a set of quality standards if you are to be using any sort of uh, radio aid or FM system with your students. Um, I hope that this part two has been helpful. Uh, there will be a part three and four, which will be looking at teaching strategies and how hearing impairment impacts language, which will be delivered by um, Heidi, our other teacher of the deaf. If you do have any questions regarding this um, part two, then please feel free to either email me or um, alternatively, you, when we're all back to normal, you can call the office. Um, thank you very much for listening and I hope this has been helpful. Thank you.